Cincinnati 1928. The Jazz Age is in full swing. So is Prohibition, at least on paper. Cincinnatians work downtown and play at Coney Island. Play there, that is, if they're white. And at North Avondale Elementary School, Miss Pitchell's third grade class poses for its school picture. A black boy and a white boy stand side by side. But in the largely segregated reality of Cincinnati 1928, they are not friends. In fact, they have no idea the other even exists. I didn't even know him. I didn't even know who he was. <laughs> He was as far as I expected. He's a perfect stranger. Just a different world. They lived one place and we, we lived another place. Third grade ends. They go their separate ways. Italy, 1944. A white boy from Miss Pitchell's class in Cincinnati and a black boy from that exact same class are airmen in World War II. The white boy flies bombers. The black boy flies fighters sometimes in the exact same mission, sometimes side by side. He could have been from here to there on my wing. But in the segregated reality of the U.S. military 1944, they are not friends, do not interact, and they have no idea the other even exists. I never saw any of the white pilots that we escorted. The war ends. They go their separate ways. But then, decades after their class picture was taken, a white man and a black man from Miss Pitchell's class returned to the same school they attended in 1928. But this time as something they could not have been as children, the best of friends. You see, more than half a century after World War II ends, just by chance the two men meet at a military reunion, and as old vets tend to do, begin to talk and discover. He so I said, well, you know, we live 10 minutes apart. And he said, you know, Herb, I went to a little school up there. It was the old Workham Estate. And he said, I was there in the third grade. And he said, were you in Miss Pitchell's third grade class or second grade? I said, yeah, I was in Miss Pitchell's class. He said, why, were you in there? He said, yeah, I was in that class. I said, Johnny, I, I walked up Warwick Avenue and walked across the street. I was there in the third grade. I said, well, I didn't know you. He said, I didn't know you. <laughs> and that's where it could have ended. A couple of old guys, an interesting coincidence, and that's all. But. That's not all. I came home and started rooting around and stuff around here, and, and I found that picture. And I, I didn't know it was John at the point. At that point, I looked at it and I said, I said, there's a little black fellow I'm standing next to. So I made a copy of the picture. I got a little picture in the mail a few days later. and said, hey, John, if this picture is you, this thing's getting real crazy or something. <laughs> a little black guy and this picture is you. And they said, because that's me standing right next to you. <laughs> And there we were standing right there, ears touching almost, and never knew each other. What happened between this and this <laughs> is the story of the boys in the picture, the story you're about to see, a story of growing up 10 minutes and two worlds apart, of a military which would let you die in the same skies but not sleep in the same barracks, and finally, a story for the children of today who can learn what it really means to go from simply standing next to each other to truly standing side by side. All the children, let's sit together one of these days, oh, one of these days. Here's a toast to the host of those who love the vastness of the Unless you fought in World War II, or at least lived through that era, you might not recognize the lyrics to that song. But you will as it continues. It's the Air Force song. You know, off we go into the wild blue yonder. Off we go into the wild blue yonder, climbing high into the sun. But back when the song was written, the Air Force was part of the Army. Part of that Army Air Corps, Lieutenant Herbert Heilberg, 301st Bomber Group, and Lieutenant John Lear, 332nd Fighter Group. The hell they faced in the skies was the same. I can remember Brux and Blackhammer in Vienna and Odertal in Munich, and how can you forget that, you know, when you're, when you're, 
You're looking out the window and seeing death every day. The leader says, break, break, that means we're under attack. And I broke right, and, and I looked around, the whole sky was full of German aircraft. That's all I could see. But if life at 20,000 feet was the same for Herm and John, life on Earth was far different, as different as black and white. The African-American pilots had their own segregated unit, the Tuskegee Airmen, named after the all-black college where they trained. To the white flyers, what the Tuskegees had to endure was simply not on the radar. They were just pilots the white guys never met. Well, I knew that's what they did, but I didn't know they did it because of segregation or anything like that. I mean, they, I didn't know the Tuskegee experiment. And all I knew is they flew P-51s with red tails, and boy, when we saw them, we were happy to see them. To John, however, segregation was a constant. The official Army songbook may have had the Star Spangled Banner, but it also had Dixie, Old Black Joe, and images of happy slaves on the plantation. The Tuskegee Airmen trained in Alabama. The plantation was not just history. We were coming back to the base one night, and uh, we were stopped by a white officer, and uh, he got out of his car. I don't know what he stopped us for, for nothing almost. And so, where are you niggers going? And I just uh, popped up and said, we're not niggers, we're officers in the United States Army Air Corps. And when I said that, the guy just, well, I guess he went bong bongo or something. He reached down, he got his pistol and pulled it out and came back to me. I was sitting in the back part of the car, put it to my temple and said, nigger, say one more word and I'll blow your goddamn brains out. Say something, just say something, one word, just say something. Well, of course I'm here, I didn't say anything, but it made me realize how fragile life was and what a thin line you had to walk to just to be alive down there. So you had to be tough, determined, and for both John and her, that personal internal strength started back in Cincinnati, thanks to their parents. Cincinnati in the 1920s and 30s, other than Miss Pitchell's class, was not just segregated in the schoolhouse, it was segregated by neighborhood too. Avondale, where Herb Heilbrunn lived a pretty comfortable life, even during the Great Depression, was just about all white. Just about. But there was a little enclave of African Americans, the Lear family since the 1890s, when John's great-grandfather, a black Union Army veteran of the Civil War, moved in from the South. With basically a neighborhood that was composed of labor type people. We didn't have any professionals in there or anything. It was not an easy life. We knew where we were. We couldn't go to theater Cincinnati, you know, the theaters were all segregated or we could I think they would let you go up in the balcony downtown at a few of the theaters, but they were segregated. And restaurants, you couldn't go to any restaurant, any place in Cincinnati and eat. You couldn't go in the White Castle and sit down and eat. So you knew beyond a doubt who you were and where your place was and where they expected to be expected you to be one place you could have been working for well-to-do white families john's father was a chauffeur his mother worked as a domestic they both stressed education they both stressed pride it sunk in when she would work for people they had to call her mrs lear she would not work for anyone who called her rose or rosie her name was rose rose but she said, I'm, I'm not Rose, I'm Mrs. Lear. If they won't call, and I've seen her go out to work, and she would come back home within an hour or two. She refused to call me Mrs. Lear, so I left. She wouldn't work for anybody that would not address her as Mrs. Lear, even though she was a maid or doing laundry work and helping them. But she demanded respect, and my father demanded that too. And I think I attained that thing from them and I still demand a certain amount of respect from everybody I deal with. I give them the respect and I demand it in return. I don't accept anything less than that. Herb Heilbrunn's childhood was a lot easier. Even during the Great Depression, Herb's family in the clothing business did okay considering the times. I had my teeth fixed, played the violin and, uh, and went to camp and, and life, was, life was good when I was a, a young fella. This is me on Warwick Avenue. Look at this, it's my mother and me. But if life for young Herb Heilbrunn was mostly good, there was one big bump. His parents divorced. Which was uh, very traumatic for me, because in those days people 
They didn't get divorced, you know. Herb's neighborhood friends were all white. John was one of just two black kids in Miss Pitchell's class. Those African-American youngsters were sent there because the closest all-black school was too far away and the school board did not want to pay for busing. But young Herb never knew of any of that. Well, I didn't realize what social stratas were. I didn't realize what racism was. I didn't know what segregation was. And uh, uh, it, it, really, it, it really didn't cross my mind. Uh, uh, I, I didn't hang around with him, because, not because he was black and I didn't like black people, because I'd never in my life heard a racial remark or anything derogatory said about anybody from my family. And uh, uh, I just had other friends. and, and uh, I assumed he probably had other friends, and it, it really never, never crossed my mind. But one thing did stick with Herb, a lesson that black people got the lousy jobs, the gritty jobs. To this day, Herb recalls the men who would pick up after the neighborhood's coal-fired furnaces. And I can remember seeing the ash men. They were always, it seemed to me, they were always black. And they'd stand in that, in that wagon, and their faces were kind of, kind of ashen from the ashes. And I, for some reason, I still remember that it didn't, there was something about that that didn't ring right to me. And I can remember my mother, God bless her, she loved Christmas. And every year, for some reason or other, they would, all the ash men would get a pair of socks. And I can remember my mother, wrapping those in red tissue paper and giving them to them for Christmas. Now that's what I remember when I was a little kid. Actually, there's something else Herb Heilbrunn recalls from that childhood, playing pretend pilot with a kid next door. But I can remember making these models and then we'd go in his second story bedroom and we'd put a match in them and sail them out the window seat and watch it go down. And then we read books. There was a pulp magazine called G8 and his Battle Aces and they were Nippy Weston and Bull Martin. That's something to remember when I was a kid, but they flew, they flew spots and, uh, and uh, they get in all kinds of trouble. Young Herb Heilbrunn wanted that kind of trouble. So did young John Lear. They both remember looking up at the sky and thinking, I have got to be up there. I wanted to fly. And John, I quote him, he says, Herb, I just wanted to fly airplanes. It was in me, I always wanted to fly. Cincinnati Lunkin Airport. When Herb Heilbrunn and John Lear were kids, this is where you came to watch airplanes. 80 years later, Herb and John came back again when another World War II veteran stopped by for a visit. It reminds me of one of the, one of the uh, parts of my life that I'll never forget. And uh, it's a B-17 Flying Fortress, as you know. And it had a crew of 10 men. And, uh, we, we had 13 50 caliber machine guns, and uh, we carried 2,800 gallons of gasoline and six 1,000 pound RDX bombs. And I had uh, 35 missions in it over Germany, Austria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and Northern Italy, and uh, 261 hours and 50 minutes of combat. Don't forget the 50 minutes. Seeing a B-17 at Lunkin brought back memories for John, too. Memories of what he saw during his 132 combat missions, flying escort in a P-51. Sometimes you'd see a flash where a bomb plane got hit in a bomb bay or something, and then when you looked at next, you'd see parts of the airplane going down, wings, parts, engines, and things swirling around, and we'd always look to see how many parachutes we could see, if any. And uh, I'll tell you, made me glad I was flying fighters when I could sit there and have to look at something like that and think of the fellows that were on that airplane and the hell they were going through. But Lunkin Airport brought back another memory for John Lear. When I was in high school, I went out to Lunkin Airport with a vocational, you know, day vocation day, and the first thing the man told me out there, I says, uh, looked at me, I was the only black person there. He says, there's no place in aviation for Negroes today. There would be a place, but it took a war for it to happen. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Our country was attacked at Pearl Harbor. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked. Well, I uh, 
heard that they were going to start a black squadron, a fighter, black fighter squadron. And I could hardly wait to, to get in that fray and, and, and fly and represent my country. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. And I thought, well, this is my opportunity. If I'll ever learn to fly, it should probably be here, so. Herb Heilbrunn saves everything. Of course, he saved Miss Pitchell's class picture. But Herb also saved his personal part of World War II. Photos, medals, including the Distinguished Flying Cross for Heroism, bringing back his four-engine B-17 with two engines out and two leaking oil. Actually, they should have given the medal of the airplane. I just kind of hung on. <laughs> Herb saved pictures of his bombing runs, and he saved the gear which helped keep him alive. Well, this is one of my memorabilia that I really wanted to keep. It's my helmet and my goggles and my oxygen mask that uh, I flew my 35 combat missions with. And uh, I didn't want to leave that with the United States Army Air Corps. So uh, when I was mustered out of service, I. I just put this in my bag and uh, two weeks later I got a bill for it for $15, which I was happy to send them, but it's something that uh, it's important to me, so uh, it's right here whenever I want to look at it. A lot of prayers and sweat in this thing. A lot of prayers in another thing too, Herb's diary. 11 today was the day I'd been waiting for for a long, long time my first mission. For Herb Heilbrunn, the diary was a chance to take a deep breath and thank a higher power for getting him back alive. I decided with a few prayers to try to make it home. Left the formation over Lake Lucina, and five minutes later, my number two engine quit out of fuel. Turned it, turned in the radio compass, which took us right to the field, and we barreled into the traffic pattern and landed. I had my two shots of whiskey at the dispensary tonight, First time I, so that's the first time since Maribor, but I needed it. A little prayer. Be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, with whatsoever thou goest. Joshua 1 9. Always have to have a prayer. I guess I had said a nice little prayer before I got out of that. That would be August 15, 1944. John and three other Tuskegees were surrounded by German airplanes. Enemy planes. The odds are bad this morning. Nearly three to one. Now about that time, the uh, guy that was leading this flight called, here, where are you, where are you? I said, well, I'm back here. And the whole mess of German planes and my guns won't fire. And I looked around and the only thing I could do was start twisting and turning and maneuvering and trying to keep out of the gunfire, and every place I looked, all I could see was ME-109 for the nose pointed at me and little puffs of smoke coming out of those guns. So I slipped and skidded all over the sky for, it seemed like an eternity. I don't know how long it was, but finally I found myself in a position where they weren't flying at me too much, and I hit my emergency war boost that we have in those planes, and my plane went up just like an elevator. I mean, that thing gets zoomed right straight up almost, but it was flat, and when I got up high enough, I could look down, I see German planes flying all around there, and then I was up high enough that I could get, a, get myself together and get back to base. I was able to pull them together and get back to base safely, and, uh, we lost two men and shot down in that battle. And this is yours truly, this is me. And John we were, Lear has pictures was, too. Pictures of young African-American men who fought and in some cases died for their country. And this was uh, James Polkenhorn. He was a fellow from Florida and he got killed overseas. But there's one picture which remains only in John Lear's mind, not in his scrapbook. Carol Langston, no photos, just a letter from Langston's parents. My wife, Mark Reed, and I are completely at a loss as to anything, and there is absolutely nothing that can occupy our minds but the passing of our dear son. 
John Lear and Carol Langston shared the same tent, shared the same dangers. But while there are plenty of pictures of the Tuskegee Airmen, there's no picture of John's buddy who was killed in action. Carol Langston looked different than the 450 other Tuskegees. Light-skinned, he had passed for white most of his life. He had a law degree. But the white army wouldn't take him, and the black army sometimes made fun of him. Here's a guy who died fighting for his country, and he couldn't even know who he was or feel com comfortably. I don't think he ever felt real comfortable. I know the kids, some of the guys in the group used to kid him about it. You know, he called him white boy, <laughs> spy, and all that kind of stuff, you know. <laughs> but he never, in all the time I was in there, we were tent mates and everything. He never wanted to have a picture made. It was an agonizing conflict. So I was asking, why didn't you go, why didn't you pass? Why didn't you go ahead and pass and go for white? He said, because my birth certificate says I'm a Negro. And Which a could have meant Langston would be digging ditches or cleaning bathrooms. The Tuskegee Airmen were a huge step up, but not a step all the way up. You were still an outsider as far as America was concerned. But that's not the image America wanted to present. Three years ago, this was just another farm in Alabama. More than trees had to be cleared away. There was misunderstanding and distrust and prejudice to be cleared away. That was how the U.S. government told what happened at Tuskegee Institute during World War II, in a military film narrated by a familiar voice, a man who would someday become Commander-in-Chief, Ronald Reagan. Here above the warm, familiar hills of Alabama, these Americans are learning to fly in those tight combat formations they'll use someday to hunt down the German and Jap. Officially, it was a story of progress and unity, and it was progress compared to what used to be. Three years ago, there was only an idea. But ideas are powerful things. But other ideas die hard. Ideas like segregation and racism. Little was left to the imagination when a white captain addressed the black pilot trainees. He said, Bill, you must understand, you came down here to learn to fly airplanes. You didn't come down here to change social customs or anything. And if you go out and leave this base and you get in any kind of trouble, you're on your own. The contrast was jarring. The grim social reality facing John Lear and his fellow pilots versus the upbeat, almost sunny view presented by John Lear's own government. But one thing it proved, you can't judge a man here by the color of his eyes or the shape of his nose. As long as I was in the South, I happened to be very, very apprehensive and scared as hell all the time of what I said and what I did because I knew I could be killed any minute. On the flight strip, you judge a man by the way he flies. There was no federal anti-lynch law, there was no federal civil rights act, and we were at the mercy of whatever any white person down there wanted to do to us. Here's the answer to Adolf and Hirohito. Here's the answer to the propaganda of the Japs and Nazis. I don't care if it's flying an airplane or uh, whatever it is. Give us an opportunity and we will succeed at it. To John Lear, serving his country, flying was the answer to separate water fountains and the back of the bus. Help win the war overseas to help win the struggle for equality at home. Felt well, if this war ends and we can get through this, then they'll realize that we are as good and as capable and everything as everybody else, and we'll be treated that way. And that was the whole idea and the whole attitude that all of us had at that time. And part of white America agreed. Here's the answer, wings for this man. Here's the answer, wings for these Americans. But the American military, which gave John Lear those wings, was still segregated. African Americans were still second class. And the black pilots trained in the most hate-filled part of segregated America, Alabama. And I wanted to get the hell out of the South. John Lear landed in Europe in February 1944. Herb Heilbrunn would not be far behind. Herb Heilbrunn's wartime diary, again, November 5th, 1944. I rode as co-pilot for an old experienced pilot. He was 20 years old. They sure picked a hell of a target to break me in on. Vienna, Austria, the first of Herb's 35 missions. While John trained in the Deep South, Herb learned to fly in Texas and Nebraska, amazed that his childhood dream was about to come true. I wanted to fly combat. I was thrilled with 
airplanes in and uh, just wanted to, that's what I wanted to do. That's what I wanted to do. And after just three missions as a co-pilot, Herb became pilot in command of his own B-17. And I really had a, a lump in my throat. It was a thrill to, to see uh, all those airplanes with their sun shining on their wings and to think I was part of probably the greatest air armada the world will ever see. Each bomber was now committed. No more evasive action until bombs away. At this time, the formations were most vulnerable to attack. Everybody thought it'd be fun. Well, it wasn't fun. They shot down the plane on our left wing. They were on fire and jumping out. And uh, when I got back to the uh, hard stand and we pulled into park, I saw the airplane at the next uh, hard stand with the, the pilot had his head laying against the glass in the cockpit and uh, I saw a bottle of uh, uh, plasma hanging from the radio compass and I thought, well, this isn't really going to be as exciting as I thought. One B-17 with wounded aboard was committed to a crash landing. ship was my prayer. From that day on, when we went up the Adriatic, I'd quote to myself from the 139th Psalm, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall my hand hold me, and thy right hand shall lead me. You understand there were no atheists in cockpits in World War II. With our full crew aboard and our trust in the Lord, we're coming in on a wing and a prayer. It truly was, for Herb Heilrun, a wing and a prayer. That's why Herb keeps so many things. The diary, the pictures, even a piece of flak, the deadly anti-aircraft chunks that could bring down a bomber. It reminds me of uh, uh, what we did and, and uh, uh, the list of people that didn't come back, you know, Ashenburner, Brown, Cole Flesh, Ferrara, Harris, Udley. And this veteran of 35 combat missions is convinced there would have been another name on that list, the name Heilbrunn, were it not for those little P-51s with the red tails and the black pilots. I have to say that, it, that really if it hadn't been for the fighter protection that we had, uh, it's a good chance I wouldn't be here today, no question about it. More than 60 years after it helped win World War II, the P-51 Mustang still says speed and power. The best American fighter plane in the skies. Although John Lear was not surprised that the Tuskegee Airmen got the second best of the best. We got all the Conquer airplanes. We, it was the same old situation that you had in civilian life. When did you get your first new one? First new P-51? I never did get a new P-51. I always flew old ones, uh, old ones. I never got a new one. You got the jobs nobody else wanted, and uh, so when you got qualified for a better job, uh, they'd grudgingly give you what they had to. But nothing more, nothing new and shiny like this P-51D model. John flew the older P-51C, but still he was a proud fighter pilot, and like so many other fighter jocks, John Lear nicknamed his airplane. That name, a combination of John's mother's name, Rosilia, and his girlfriend at the time, Harvina. So I, I said, put it Vina Rose. <laughs> and so I took part of my mother's name and part of her name and named my plane that. Herb Heilbrunn would have named his plane if he could have, but Herb's B-17 had already been christened by other pilots before Herb got there. And I never did get to put Mary Lou on my plane. That was my mother. So while Mary Lou Heilbrunn and Rosalia Lear waited and prayed in Cincinnati just a few miles apart, their sons would end up just a few feet apart, dropping bombs and dodging German fighters. See, he could have been from here to the window with next to me. I wouldn't have known. Besides the prayers and the diary, Herb Heilbrunn kept something else too, his flight log, a list of every minute in the skies from training through his final mission, April 16th, 1945. And then this is when I started to put my stuff in there when I flew and my trip overseas and everything. I like records. Among those records, logbook entries for bombing runs, including December 2nd, 1944, Blechhammer, Germany, and another mission a couple of weeks later. 
This is December 16th, 44, Brooks, Czechoslovakia. It was a long haul today and we had a full load. They threw up a box barrage over the target, the likes of which I'd never seen. It was a solid wall and we were heading right into it on the bomb run. It was up, we were up nine hours and 10 minutes and was plenty tired when we got back. Of course, neither had any idea at the time, but also up there with Herb over Black Hammer in early December and Brux in mid-December on the very same days, a guy from the old neighborhood, a guy from Miss Pitchell's class, John Lear, flying fighter cover with the Red Tails. You see, John kept his logbook too. The mission dates match for Blechhammer and Brux, hours in the skies together. Well, I knew that, you know, that, that they were there to take care of me. Then, back to quarters. White flyers to theirs, black flyers to another. Guys here, I was in the same thing, the same mission with this fellow, but uh, we never knew each other. We never had seen each other. We didn't know anything about each other. We'd been overseas together, but we never were in the same, uh, you know, uh, bars or where. And I mean, there were some towns you could go into in Italy where you might go if you left the base and went in town, you could find a little bar or something, but I wasn't the kind of guy that went in town to bars or any places, so I never saw any of the white pilots that we escorted. Were you aware of, of uh, the racial segregation in the service? It was just like, we're gonna do our job, they're gonna do their job, we don't think about it. I wasn't aware of it, and I did meet two, two Tuskegee fellows in a bar in Foggia, Italy one time, and they were great guys, and I said, you guys do a heck of a job, and Sure, happy to see you. And we had uh, we had a couple of drinks, and, and I never met one until I found John. When the logbook dates would start to match, and the memories, and the picture. Now that they're friends, Herb and John can laugh. Laugh at the good times they had as America's brave young aviators learning to fly. This is the great old AT-6. I knew we had a good yeah, time flying that. Yeah. <laughs> and there were good times. And seeing a familiar airplane here at the Tri-State Warbirds Museum is like reuniting with yet another old pal. Well, that, uh, that airplane is uh, my second favorite and I think John's second favorite too. The B-25 twin-engine bomber, the same plane used by the Doolittle Raiders over Tokyo, the same plane John Lear flew as an escape aircraft, weekend escapes from Tuskegee, Alabama segregation when John was a flight instructor right after the war. The crews needed training hours. The planes needed flying, so why not? I used to bring B-25s home up here to Cincinnati quite often, bring, oh, we could haul about 14 or 15 people in it, and you'd find people from the area, and you'd fly home. So I could fly home in a B-25 for a weekend, and did it quite, quite often. <laughs> Come out to Lunkin Airport with a B-25 full of people. Herb remembers the B-25, too. Before the war, Herb tested the aircraft's engines while working at Wright Aeronautical, now GE Aviation in Evendale. But there's another reason, too. A childhood friend who flew the B-25 in the China-Burma-India theater in World War II. He bailed out of one and they brought him home. I still have a piece of his parachute that his mother gave me. And a few days later, he volunteered for another mission and they said there'd be no opposition. Well, they ran into 25 zeros and they did a lot of shooting and uh, Two of the B-25s got away and they saw my friend, his name was Roy Brown. They saw him grab his chest and fall over the wheel, so my buddy is still at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, so that, I, that means a lot of memories when I fly that airplane. That's a wonderful airplane. Uh, Johnny used to dogfight in it uh, when he was instructor and uh, I always said I wish the two of us had one of these, we could really have a ball. Oh dear me. Uh. <laughs> A lot of memories, huh? Oh, yeah. Of course, Herb's favorite airplane was the B-17, the plane which got him through 35 combat missions alive. The last mission, April 16, 1945. The plane, not named by Herb, Jack Haley's Comet. You know, he was a tin man in the Wizard of Oz. And I met him after the war. And it was really quite a review. I didn't know him overseas, but I met him in Cincinnati in a review. He was a nice man, very nice man. And uh, different airplanes had different personalities, even though it was all the same airplane. You know, one of them, maybe the tack wasn't just right, or maybe the low pressure wasn't just right, but I liked his airplane. I liked his airplane. Less than a month after Herb and Jack, the airplane, not the actor, made it back to base, the war in Europe was over. VE Day, 
time for America to rejoice. Three more months and VJ Day, Japan surrendered. It was time for all the heroes to come home. All together, shout it now. There's no one who can doubt This country has never been as congealed and as one as they were in World War II. Who ever heard of women in factories with rivet guns and, and uh, rationing and, this, and the stars in the windows and everybody was just one. The African American community was part of that one. John Lear was hailed as a hero too when he came home, in the black neighborhoods anyway. But that second mission of the Tuskegee Airmen helped win the war overseas to help change America at home. Well, defeating the Nazis may have actually been easier than defeating racism. We felt that when we came out of the war, things were going to be different. That was the whole attitude. We went to the war, and we went in there with the idea things are not right. But when we come out, everything's going to be right, and it's going to be worthwhile. It's going to be a worthwhile battle. But we came back to the same old things. And John's childhood dream had been to fly. That dream came true in wartime. But back in peacetime, John Lear, a highly skilled, experienced pilot, could not get a job with an airline. The chilling put down John received before the war at Lunkin Airport, there's no place in aviation for Negroes, was replaced with a more polite, but no less insulting response from private air carriers. Sorry, nothing available. That is, if they even bothered to answer at all. They, they, they'd throw your application away, wouldn't even look at it. In Alabama, not far from where John learned to fly, America learned what John had felt firsthand, the power of hate. But things were changing. Because I have a dream today. A few of the kids from Miss Pitchell's class took those first steps towards breaking the invisible barriers which locked them in separate worlds back in 1928. Well, every once in a while, you see Art Spiegel. He's a federal judge. He was a classmate of ours, and I used to talk to him every once in a while. And I had him refer clients to me after they won some cases with black people who had money, and I was an investment break broker at that time, and they would refer him to me. So I, I had some, you know, experiences that were not bad. You know, so everything wasn't bad. But if things were starting to change, there was one thing which actually got worse. At least during the war, the Tuskegee Airmen were appreciated by their fellow flyers, even if the social realities of the day did not let them express that appreciation in person. To, to see the Tuskegee and the Red Tails, it was, you know, we always had a little smile and, and they, were, they were there, they were there. Were you were conscious that it was a black unit as yes, opposed we, to just some airplanes? Yes, we were. And the success of the Tuskegee Airmen in the Skies helped convince President Harry Truman to desegregate the military in 1948. But the courageous pilots who fought the Germans overseas and the color line at home never got the credit. And if I told people I had been a fighter pilot, flew airplanes, they'd look at you and laugh because there was no publicity ever made by the government that there were black pilots flying or anything. My kids didn't know anything about it until they were grown up that there were black, you know, some of them grew up without ever hearing, reading, or knowing anything about it. And so the story of the Tuskegee Airmen was just something that was hidden away in the records of the military and uh, wasn't uh, publicized until we finally started telling the story in the 70s. But if most Americans knew nothing of the Tuskegee Airmen, some Americans did and one would finally do something about it. The greatest generation, the men and women who saved the world, was starting to fade away. And this was Harold Sawyer from Columbus, Ohio. And we flew in the same squadron and we both finished tours of combat together. And uh, he died a few years ago. We always counted when they came back to see how many who didn't, you know, didn't come back. Uh, so, uh, you know, they were, we were brothers. We were, we were close. We were very, very close. I'm the last one of my crew alive. Perhaps it was to honor those no longer here. 
Perhaps it was a sense of doing something before it was too late. But whatever the reason, Herb Heilbrunn decided he had to take one more mission, this time to say thank you. I was sitting here on a Saturday morning reading the paper and I saw that they were honoring him down on the square in Cincinnati and at a reception. <laughs> It was 1996, there's John Lear driving the car. Following a neighborhood parade, Mayor Roxanne Qualls honored the Tuskegee's in the public heart of Cincinnati, Fountain Square. Through their courage and service, they paved the way for others to follow. And a kid from Miss Pitchell's 1928 third grade class was among the honorees, talking about the struggle and the pride of African American aviators. It was the first black flying unit that ever got into the Air Corps. The Air government didn't want us and uh, did everything possible to keep us out of it. Herb Heilbrunn did not see that TV interview with his old classmate and Air Corps colleague, but he did see this article. So I thought, you know, I wonder if I could, it's been 53 years, and I said, I just said to myself, I wonder if I could find a guy that flew when I did. I didn't know the Tuskegee people had a local chapter. I didn't, I didn't know about that. And, uh, but of course I knew what the, who the Tuskegee Airmen were because they escorted us and we were glad to see them and, and it was unique that they were all black and, and they flew the best airplane in the, war, in the air. And I thought, I wonder if I could find a fellow. I said, ah, I, it can't happen. But something said, you better go down there. So down I go. The kids who once stood side by side, who once flew side by side, were about to be side by side once again. Something which could not happen during World War II finally happened in Cincinnati as a white pilot walked into a room full of black pilots. I'm sure they didn't think I was a Tuskegee Airman. You know, I walked in there and, and I went up to this fellow who turned out to be John Sonardi. I didn't know it at the time. And I told him the story. I flew B-17s and <clears throat> I wonder if there's anybody here that might have flown in Italy when I did. And he said, my dad, John Lear, flew over there. So I go over there and I walked up to him and I said, you know, I've been waiting 53 years to give you a hug. He came over to me and he gave me a big hug and I was saying I was been, been waiting a long time to say thanks to one of you guys. Now it's not like John and her became best friends in seconds, nor did they discover all the things they had in common right then and there, but something did click, a connection, a sense that yes, we have a shared past. Let's not go our separate ways. This time, let's meet again. One thing led to another and we got together and we had dinner and, and he got out his log sheet and I got out my log sheet and found out that he actually had taken me to Brex Czechoslovakia and to Black Hammer, Germany in December of, uh, of uh, 44. Germany and Czechoslovakia in 1944 soon dissolved back to Cincinnati, 1928. We knew we lived close together and, then he, and uh, I think, I don't know, he asked me or something if I went to North Avondale and I, I said yes, and he said, were you in Miss Pitchell's third grade class or second grade? I said, yeah, I was in Miss Pitchell's class. He said, why, were you in there? He said, yeah, I was in that class. And I said, well, I didn't know you. He said, no, I didn't know you. <laughs> so we just let it go at that, and then Herb said he went home and starts, Herb is a pack rat, <laughs> keeps everything. <laughs> everything. I dug out my picture of Miss Pitchell's third grade class. And we just had a lot in common, had a lot more in common than most people have, you know, and the friendship developed from there. And there were 41 children in the class, and there was one black boy, and I'm standing right next to him, and it's John. So we think that was destiny. We think that was destiny. To be in the same school would be something, to be in the same class would be something, but to be standing almost cheek to cheek was, uh, this had to be, it just had to be. It was a storybook ending, which required one more thing, a storybook. And in writing this book, I wanted to keep the past alive. And when they were in the third grade together, they really could not be friends. It was not on the agenda in America in 1928. John Fleischman had heard the stories, seen the wartime memorabilia, and of course, the side-by-side -side picture. When you talk about the greatest generation, just as Herb Heilbrunn and John Lear had met by chance, John Fleischman's connection to all this was a stroke of luck as well. Well, my best friend in Cincinnati, uh, Chot Fun Alstall, has an older sister who married an older man, and that was Herb Heilbrunn. And so Chot was always telling me about his brother-in-law who flew B-17s. Not only flew B-17s, but had incredible stories about the war, 
and about flying in the same missions with a guy he once stood next to in elementary school but never knew, and well... So when you first saw that picture, what did you think? I thought it was incredible. I just thought it was incredible. I mean, you hear about these, you know, the, you hear wonderful stories all the time, but sometimes you just have to take them on, on the person's word. But this story came with the picture, it came with the documents, it came with the law books, and plus talking to John and Herb. When people are, are telling you as, it, as they think it is true, and, and it sounds true, and it matches up with documents, that's a perfect story. And so, Black and White Airmen, their true history, a children's book, not just history, however, but a personal story kids can relate to. I tell people it's, it's, it's a story about war and flying to segregation, but it's really a story about friendship and it has a happy ending. I think that's the other thing I want kids to take away from it. Uh, it has a very happy ending. Those two guys who could not have been friends in the third grade are the best of friends now. And that's, that's a wonderful happy ending as far as I'm concerned. And that wonderful happy ending was about to get even better. September 24, 2007, North Avondale Elementary School, Cincinnati, Ohio. If you listened carefully, you could hear 79 years melt away. The two eight-year-old boys who stood side by side in Miss Pitchell's North Avondale classroom came back as 87-year-old men, came back to the same school. It's really uh, an exciting experience for me to come back up here and to see such a wonderful group of young people here and uh, feel that I was a part of this place when it got started. <laughs> and they told their story again, segregation, the war, and of course, the picture. And there were 41 children in that class, and there was one little black fella, and I'm standing right next to him, or cheek by cheek, and that's my friend John. My friendship with him is one of the most heartwarming and gratifying experiences that I've ever had. Maybe the war stories sunk into these eight-year-olds, maybe they didn't. But the friendship part for a kid, that's easier to understand. And who knows, here in North Avondale School, there might just be a future fighter pilot and a future bomber pilot, who will be what John Lear and Herb Heilbrunn could not be back when they were in third grade, friends. Hopefully, we'll wake them up to the ideas of what racism is and the falsifications of what it means, you know, how stupid it is, really. All this racism and stuff that's American, but uh, we've got to get away from it. And we try to get these kids, while they're young enough, before they get ingrained with racism and prejudice, that they will throw it out before it becomes a part of their lives. Well, you know, our whole lives have been parallel but separated. I mean, we were in the third grade together. We both worked at Wright Aeronautical Corporation where they tested engines out here, which is now GE. We were both in the air together. We were both at Wright-Patterson in Dayton together. And you know, I could have passed him in the hallways and never known about it. So our whole lives were parallel, but, but separated. But now, finally, side by side. Here's a toast to the host of those who love the vastness of the sky. I've never stopped saying thank you. <laughs> never stopped. To a friend we send a message of his brother men who fly. Herb felt that this is a, it just, not something that just happened. He said, all oh, this just came together. He said, I believe it was a fate, the fate. It was something that was put together and planned that we were to meet and to do this and that we were designed to uh, maybe tell this story. His plan, plan was to tell the story and to let people know that there's uh, no difference. We're all the same and we should be treating each other that way. We really have a friendship and uh, it, it, it just warms my heart because, I, I, as I said, knowing what he went through and uh, never having any black friends, and uh, he's, he's, he's just, uh, he, has, he has the one, one quality that I admire more than anything else in a person, and that's integrity. He's a, he's a fine man, and, and uh, he's the only, I, I, I love my friends, but he's the only one that can, that can make me laugh or he can bring tears to my eyes with some of the things that happened to him. I like, I like the laughing better. Well, 
Johnny, I don't know. Can you? I'll just say a couple of words and let Johnny finish it. I don't remember. I, I don't. I don't say a couple of words. I heard they, that that's most of talking. <laughs> <laughs> no, you. And do I don't not. mind letting him talk. <laughs> was missing two hours overdue one of our planes was missing with all its gallant crew the radio sets were humming they waited for the word then a voice broke through the humming and this is what they heard coming in on a wing and a prayer coming in on a wing and a prayer though there's one motor gone we can still carry on Coming in on a wing and a prayer What a show, what a fight Yes, we really hit our target for tonight How we sing as we limp through the air Look below, there's our field over there With our full crew aboard and our trust in the Lord We're coming in on a wing and a prayer How we sing as we limp through the air Look below, there's our field over there With our full crew aboard and our trust in the Lord, we're coming in on a wing and a prayer. Miss Pitchell, one tough cookie, I'll tell you right now. <laughs> I saved a picture and I, I, I'm glad I did. <laughs>